that's interesting. Oh, there they go. All right, so I'll just move that down so they don't go all over the place. And here we go. Let's let's uh, get on into our into our message. Get back on the screen. We're talking about these names of God. Now the the Hebrew names of God, and any all Hebrew names basically have a uh, a very um, so I got something in my beard. Got to get it out. They have a they have very um, specific meanings, and they tell us things about the the person whoever whoever they are. Uh, they, they tell us something about that person by the name, and God is no exception to that. He has uh, he has some elements of his names that are uh, they should be very near and dear to our heart. So we're going to start uh, tonight, and we're, keep in mind you can get the um, get the quiz. Uh, the link is on the on the website. But we're going to start tonight with the very first name that we see in Scripture of God, and that's Elohim. That's E-L-O-H-I-M. Now, this is a complex name of God. This name, it highlights both the creative power of our Lord, but it also highlights the His role as judge. Now, with Elohim, that name means one who is mighty. It also means the Lord who creates. So right at the beginning of the Bible, in Genesis 1-1, we get four words into Scripture when we see the first name of God, Elohim. It says, in the beginning, God, and that was the Elohim God, created the heaven and the earth. Now, that's a powerful statement right there. That statement alone, it refutes atheism, it refutes uh, pantheism, it refutes, it refutes all sorts of of different things there. I think it refutes nine different religions just in in the very first statement. Now, the word Elohim, the name of God Elohim, that is actually a plural form, but of a of the word God in Hebrew. This is a plural word, um, but it's being used as a singular verb, uh, well, with a singular verb, excuse me, created. Um, now, this is this word choice right here is is pointing straight to the Godhead. It's pointing straight to the fact that there's a Father, there's a Son, and there's a Holy Spirit. And we've got we've got um, one God, the Father, His Son Jesus, and His Spirit. Now later we get uh, in Genesis two four we see the word Elohim again. If you're in the Hebrew, but in the King James, we're looking at the word God here. It says, it says um, we actually see it uh, a little bit different. We see another word with it. So if you follow along in your, in your Bible, if you turn to Genesis 2, 4, you'll see, these are the generations of the heavens and the earth when they were created in the day that the Lord God, uh, now this white's particulars because you have two different titles for God here. You have Lord God. Now, this would be Jehovah Elohim. When the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. Now, like I said here, Elohim is paired with Jehovah, and this shows us that the, co the, the covenant-keeping nature of the Creator God, Jehovah God, Lord God. And we're going to get into that name Jehovah shortly. Now, Elohim speaks very specifically of God as judge, but also speaks, and like a judge, it also speaks of authority. Now, <clears throat> beyond creation, Elohim is also a title for other types of authority and judgment. It, it actually translates <clears throat> the word Elohim, not only does it translate as God, it translates as judges and passages like uh, Exodus 22, verses 8 through 9, uh, where it describes uh, those who carry out justice. It says, If the thief be not found, then the master of the house shall be brought unto the judges. Now, this is that word Elohim, but it's used differently. To see whether he have put his hand unto his neighbor's goods. All right. So, we're we're going to be, we're going to be looking at this how that word Elohim can be used 
with a capital G God, a lowercase g God, and also the word judges. Um, let's see, Exodus uh, 21 and 6, the word of God says this, uh, then his master shall bring unto the judges, there's that Elohim again, he shall also bring him to the door or unto the doorpost, and his master shall bore his ear through uh, with an awl, he shall serve him forever. All right, so <clears throat> so now we've got it used for judges twice here. Also, that word Elohim, it translates to another word. It translates to angels. In Psalms 97 and 9 and, verse, um, and chapter 8 and 5, it says, um, we're referring to uh, to uh, beings of great power here. So we're, Psalm seventy, excuse me, Psalms ninety seven and nine declares, "For Thou, Lord, all uppercase, art high above all the earth. Thou art exalted far above all gods, lowercase uh, Elohim." And that there is the plural form of the um, of the word in, um, Elohim, um, not used in not used in the singular, but used in the plural specifically because because it's talking about um, it's talking about a lesser god or a false god or um, even um, even angels here. Here, Elohim is referring to heavenly beings, uh, and this emphasizes the Lord's supremacy because Elohim, God the Father, is above all of these things. Now, Psalms eight and five it says, "For Thou hast made him a." Lo- little lower than the angels. That word angels is Elohim and has crowned him with glory and honor. This means that that man is just a little lower than these mighty beings, showing the the greatness of both angels, but also the greatness of humanity. Um, now, to be clear, this we have God the Father set apart way above them. Um, we have the, but we still have the same word used for, used for God, and we still have the same word used for judges, and we still have the same word used for, um, for angels as well. Okay, now the singular form of the word Elohim is Eloah. All right, that, that's how you get it in singular form. So they knew very specifically to have Elohim. Be the very first one. You've got a plural form pointing straight to the Godhead in Genesis 1-1. But the word Eloha, Eloha, uh, it appears in Scripture uh, 56 times, mainly in the book of Job. Now, this form, it gives us a, a more personal touch to the to the title, and it, it often highlights um, specific things that might be maybe going on in the uh, with the individual that is that is referring to here. Uh, it refers specifically. Uh, we're going to be talking about the justice of God, and that this is a word. This word Eloi would be used, and now we can see it in Job nineteen twenty five. It's and this is how it reads in the King James: For I know that my Redeemer liveth, and that He shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. Now. Job is making a a strong declaration of faith right here. Um, his declaration of faith that points to the personal redeeming God, Eloi. This is a this is a very personal title for for the Lord, uh, for the Lord God. Now, in summary, here for for this name Elohim, we get to see God's might his creative power, his judicial authority, um, and we get to, to see the fact, first and foremost, that he is our Lord, uh, uh, whether in in creation or justice, or whether we're describing uh, heavenly beings, Elohim reveals that there are many sides of God. Um, this is a one name that we get to look at, and we get to stand it all, um, at, because he is our mighty creator, he's a just judge, and we get to recognize his supreme authority over all creation. So that's um, that's Elohim for us. And now we're going to move on to the next name of God, um, El Elyon. Now, this word is E-L, E-L, 
Y-O-N, El Elyon. And this means the Supreme Lord. Now, this, this particular name, it emphasizes God's supreme authority and his ownership over everything. There's nothing that you have that is not on loan from God. Now, I want you to understand this is, this is because he is the supreme Lord. Uh, and the word El Elyon, it means literally the one who is supreme or the Lord who owns. Now, this name, it appears first in Genesis 14, 18. And this is where you see uh, Melchizedek being introduced. Uh, he's the priest of the Most High God, uh, El Elyon. Now, in Genesis 14, 22, we see a, a declaration by Abram. And Abram said to the king of Sodom, I have lifted up my hand unto the Lord, the Most High God, where he, this is where El Elyon is used, the possessor of heaven and earth. Here, we, we get to see that God is, with this title, El Elyon, is recognized as the ultimate owner of everything. So when I say these names have meanings, these names have meanings. And if you'll study these names of God, it'll let you know a little bit more about him, let you have a deeper relationship with him um, because you know, you know some, some things about him. Now, the, um, the next thing, the next time we see the word El Elyon used, it's used by Balaam. Numbers 24 and 16, Balaam Despite his his doubtful character, he acknowledges the supremacy of God. Here's what the Word of God says. He hath said, which heard the words of God and knew the knowledge of the Most High, El Elyon, which saw the vision of the Almighty falling into a trance, but having his eyes open. All right. The third time we see El Elyon, uh, we, well, we see it used the same way in Deuteronomy, but also in the book of Acts. In Deuteronomy uh, 32 and 8, we, uh, Moses is speaking of God's supremacy uh, and his, his um, authority, his supreme authority. It's, the Word of God says this, When the Most High divided the nations, their inheritance, when he separated the sons of Adam, he set the bounds of the people according to the number of the children of Israel. Now, here we see that word El Elyon used again uh, when he says, and the most high. Um, here we also see where El Elyon is shown as the one that uh, signs the nations their places. To, I mean, tells the sun when to rise, tell, tells the ocean, don't you go past the shore. This is El Elyon. This is the God that is, this is the, the God that's in control. Now, this name, it speaks a lot, not just to his supreme authority, but also to his, his omnipotence. This is, this is God, and this is, I mean, you, you talk about the God that, that created the sun, that holds the power of, of, of millions of suns in, in his hand, and this is, this is supreme God here. Now, in the New Testament, we get to Acts 7 and 48. And we have a reference here of God's supreme nature. It says, Howbeit the Most High, this is Elion, dwelleth not in temples made with hands, as saith the prophet. This, and this just reminds us, one, that God's authority and presence are beyond any physical structure. A lot of times churches like to try to keep the power of God inside the, inside the, the four walls of the church. Well, you're not going to, you're not going to, nothing's binding God here. Um, God, the only thing that can bind God is His Word itself. Um, people like to um, people they like to go after the King James crowd, and they like to say, "Hey, well, you're um, you're you're binding God to a to a book." No, God bound Himself to a book. He wanted to be bound to a book. He exalts His Word even above His own name. Now, no matter what name God has for Himself, no matter how much power and authority. The one thing that he'll never do will be contrary to his word. He will not break a covenant. He will not break his word, period. Um, but so in closing on Elion, I want you to remember that this, this name, it highlights the supreme authority and ownership over all creation. Um, 
whether it was uh, acknowledged by the patriarchs, the prophets, or in the New Testament, Elohim is recognized as the most high God. All right, now the the next word that we're going to get to for a name of God is is um, Adonai, and this word means the Lord our Master. This name uh, it highlights God as a master, and it highlights Him as ruler. So Adonai, the Lord our Master, it the word literally means the Lord our Master or the one who is ruling. Now we first encounter this name in Genesis 15, 2, and, it, and the word of God reads this way. It says, And Abram said, Lord God, um, what wilt thou give me, seeing I go childless, and that the steward of mine house is Eliezer of Damascus? Here, here Abram, re uh, he recognizes God's authority over his life and over his future. He calls him a Adonai Jehovah, Lord God. Now, the word Adonai, it translates into two other words as well. It translates as sir, and it translates to owner. Um, and, you know, and th this is a side note. Maybe somebody research this and find out there may be something, um, there may be something to what I'm about to say here. Um, in Spanish, there's um, there's some specific um, some, some specific names used for God. I remember that because we've had um, um, Spanish members of the congregation, and when they'll sing songs, um, I, I forget the the specific name that they use, but I think this this may be the word that it comes from because I, I think they refer to as, like Señor. I think they're saying Señor. This may be where this A to N A may be where that word comes from in Spanish. But I'll have to check on that. I, that just hit me right here, and I wanted to put it out there in case for you, anybody that speaks Spanish. Maybe you can go and check up on that and see if I'm right or not. I think I am, but I, I, this isn't a Spanish class. So let's um, let's get back to the Adonai, sir and owner. Now, it's translated differently to convey respect and convey ownership. For for instance, in Genesis 43.20, it's translated sir when Joseph's brothers speak to him. Uh, the Word of God says this in Genesis 43, 20, and said, O oh, sir, Adonai, we came indeed down at the first time to buy food. Now, this shows that they're, they're being respectful. They use the, um, they use the, the, word, the word sir there um, from Adonai. We also see it in 1 Kings 16, 24, where the word Adonai is translated owner. And this, this one's regarding property. Uh, the word of God reads this way, 1 Kings 16, 24, and he bought the hill Samaria of Shemer for two talents of silver and built on the hill and called the name of the city, which he built after the name of the city, uh, uh, name of Shemer, owner of the hill, Adonai of the hill. This highlights the sense of possession and it highlights uh, rulership. Again, a name of God. He is our possessor. He is... He is our ruler. Uh, he is these things. This is a, this is a really great name for God to to give these these particular attributes here. Now we see the word Adonai also in Psalms and Deuteronomy. <clears throat> Psalm one ten verse one. It it gives us a um, a pretty good statement here. It says, and we've got a couple of names for gods here. It says the Lord, and it uses Jehovah here, said unto my Lord. Adonai, sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. Here we see Adonai used to indicate that there's divine and and there's an authoritative position sitting at the right hand of Jehovah. So this is one of the this is one of those great verses that um that highlight the Godhead here because I mean you see the Lord, all caps, Jehovah, we'll get to that one, said unto my Lord, Adonai capital L, sit thou at my right hand until I make thy enemies thy footstool. I mean, here, here we have God the Father talking to the Son. I mean, we, we can't be more clear that they're two separate, um, two separate divine entities here. We, we cannot be more clear on that. The Word of God is very clear on it. Um, Deuteronomy 10, 17, 
<clears throat> we have the term Adonai being used. Um, we're gonna, and it's going to be signifying supreme mas mastery. This is the respect version of it here. It says, For the Lord our God is God of gods and Lord of lords. He's the, the way it uses it, it's, it's Adonai of masters, um, Lord of lords there. A, it goes on, it says, A great God, a mighty and a terrible, which regardeth not persons, nor taketh reward. <clears throat> this verse, it establishes for us that God is the ultimate master over all masters. He is the God of gods, the Lord of lords. Uh, he's he's everything. He's he's the the buck stops with him. There's nothing higher. So, <clears throat> to cover here what we talked about with Adonai, we're we're talking about it's God's role as master and ruler, and whether he, whether it's a a personal address as in the the serve version, or a, t a title of respect, or an acknowledgement of a di of divine authority. The word Adonai, it emphasizes that God has supreme control and leadership. And he's a God worth submitting to. He's We can submit to, to him as, as Lord and God. Um, we need to recognize his rightful place as master and ruler of the universe. The next name for God we're going to look at is El Olam. And this is the everlasting God. This is this is one of those hallelujah moments here where you've got a where you've got the something that can't be destroyed here. I mean, <clears throat> no one else has an everlasting God out there. On, only Christians and only our God is 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 worth even writing songs about. The rest of them, man, we can tell, we can show the love we have for God just because of the glory we give Him by by writing songs. Other folks don't have that, man. Let, let's look here, El um, Elam. This is the everlasting God. Now, this translates two different ways. It's the Lord who reveals himself and the one who is mysterious. Now, this highlights both the eternal nature of God and also his ability to reveal himself in his own time, in his own way. So this everlasting God, this is pretty important for uh, us in dispensationalism because God can do what he wants, how he wants. He's not bound by, by, certain, by certain things, and he always does something a little bit different depending on the time period or depending on the, or the scenario at hand there. He, we, there's this idea that, and they, they get it by twisting scripture, that, oh, God, God uh, he's, he's unchanging, I change not. Absolutely, he, he doesn't. God does not change. He always has the same character. But that doesn't mean that he can't do things different from time to time. He can do what he wants. He's not bound by our definition of change not either. Um, God's character, for certain, will never change. But what God does, how he acts, how he disperses his grace, that can and will change. And it should. He's an everlasting God. It doesn't, if it were to, to stay exactly the same forever, I mean, that would be, that would be kind of boring, I think. But here he is. He's a. But we see this. Um, we see this El Elam first in Genesis. Um, we we get it first in Genesis twenty one thirty three. It says, "And Abraham planted a grove in Beersheba and called there on the name of the Lord, the everlasting God." This is El Elam. Here, Abraham he's acknowledging that God is eternal. He's acknowledging that God existed before time. He's acknowledging that God reveals himself to his people. And this is what we, the big takeaway here for this one is God is everlasting and God is mysterious by nature. He's mysterious. And well, um, the names here, they paint a good picture of God where, you know, where the, where the Godhead is, a, it is a mystery. Um, but the names, they really help paint a picture of the power and authority that, that God actually has. Now, the next name we're going to look at is Jehovah Jireh. And this is the Lord who provides. Um, this, is, um, this highlights God's provision for us. So anything we've got, it's on loan from God first off. But the phrase Jehovah Jireh, the name, title, literally translates to the Lord who provides. And this name, it 
it emphasizes God's ability to provide for our needs. Um, we see it first in Genesis uh, chapter 22, verse 14. It says, And Abraham called the name of that place Jehovah Jireh, as it is said to this day in the Mount of the Lord, all caps, it shall be seen. Now, why, when we're talking about God being a provider, it's very significant what happened here, so you understand, like, how much God can provide. This was when God provided a ram to take the place of Abraham's son, Isaac. This is, this is Abraham recognizing God's provision. This is, this is probably one of the greatest examples of God's provision in Scripture other than him providing his own son to die on the cross for our sins. Now, he is Jehovah Jireh. He is the God that provides. He is the God that makes a way where there is no way. So this is, he is a God worth worshiping. And the title Jehovah Jireh, it reflects God's role as our provider that we need to trust in. We need to trust the provision. We need to, we need to recognize that what he's done meets all of our needs. And there's, there's no need unmet here. Uh, because he's Jehovah Jireh is why we can believe and trust the gospel exclusively because it's we're bought and paid for. He he's a um, you know he's a he's a good provider, man. He, he's a he's a good good father, and part of being a good good father is being a good provider, and he's the best provider that that there ever was. Now the next name we're going to look at is Jehovah Rapha. Uh, this is the one who heals. Jehovah Rapha literally translates the one who heals. And this name, it emphasizes God's ability to, to heal our physical, emotional, and spiritual wounds. I know some people out there right now that are dealing with some things. And what, I'm, what I want to tell you is trust the Lord with whatever you're dealing with. Trust Him because He's the one that heals. Trust him because he's the one that provides. Trust him because he has all power. When you start understanding these names, I'm telling you, you are able to put more trust into that holy God. The first time we see Jehovah Rapha is in Exodus. We encountered we encounter his name in Exodus 15, 26. Uh, here's what the Word of God says, For I am the Lord that healeth thee. Here God is declaring his healing power over the Israelites. Now, we need to. There's there's a lot of things we need to recognize God at. We do need to recognize Him as um, as healer. We need to recognize Him as pro, as provider, as father, as, and we need to recognize Him as all powerful. We need to to recognize Him with and give Him all the praise, honor, and glory that He's due. Uh, anybody that's ever uh, that's ever dealt with any sickness and come out of it, and you got it. You've got breath in your lungs. You need to be thankful for that breath. God provides that healing. You know, this um, this week uh, the Lord lost a uh, the the world lost a lost a, a good man, and he's gonna be he's gonna be dearly missed. But he's 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 in glory with his uh with his Savior now. But I I can tell you this, and there are so many people like the one that the one that went to be with the Lord today that was on borrowed time and I'm telling you there's so many people have been have been healed and, and given a given the opportunity to go out and, and share that gospel and, and, and to tell people about the about the healing. There's people watching right now who've been healed from things and and we need to give that praise, honor and glory to God the Father uh, for doing that because guess what? He doesn't have to, but he does. And I'm gonna tell you what, you can um, you can motivate him a little bit by by praying. You, I'm gonna tell you what, give him honor, glory, and praise in the hard times, and see how many more good times you have. But Jehovah Rapha, this reflects God's role as our healer. Then we have uh, Jehovah Nisi. That's a uh, well, you know how to spell Jehovah, but it's N I S S I, Jehovah Nisi, and this is the Lord our banner. Um, this emphasizes the fact that that God's our protector; He's um, He's our leader. Uh, we see it first in Exodus. 
Exodus 17, 15 says, And Moses built an altar and called the name of it Jehovah Nisi. Um, here Moses says, he, he names the altar after the Lord when, when the Lord helped the Israelites defeat the Alamakites. And he, so he's recognizing God's, God's leadership. He's recognizing his, uh, his protection. Um, this is, um, um, this is reflecting God as our, as our banner. So think, think of it almost like a, like a flag, like you're flying a, flying a flag and you're, uh, you're protected here. So think about it like that. Number eight, we're halfway through the list now. Number eight is El Shaddai. That's E-L-S-H-A-D-D-A-I. Now, this means the all-sufficient one. Um, this highlights that, that God is sufficient, and it highlights that he is mighty. Um, like I said, it, it translates straight over to the all-sufficient one, and this recognizes God's ability to meet all of our needs, uh, his almighty power. Um, we first encountered the word in Genesis chapter 17, verse 1. And when Abram was 90 years old and nine, the Lord appeared to Abram and said unto him, I am the almighty God. Walk before me and be thou perfect. So here God is revealing himself as the all-sufficient one, the almighty God. So when you know, sometimes people take this one and and they'll use the name of God in, in vain, and they'll say God Almighty. They 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 do that, and they're really what they're getting to is the fact one He is God Almighty. He is He is all powerful, and but they they profess His name in a um in a, a very negative way. Um, you got to be careful with that when you um you start throwing around um name you start throwing around the names of God. Um, you, be careful. You might be asking for something that you don't realize you're asking for, and uh, and you know you might want to uh, might want to tip your hat a little bit, show a little respect uh, uh, to the all sufficient, to the Almighty One, to the to the One that taking His name. If He wanted to, He could that breath He used could be the last one. So we see the um, we also see El Shaddai and Isaiah, and that the name translates to another name. It translates to wonderful. And in Isaiah 9, 6, it says um, a wonder. Isaiah 29 and 14, um, excuse me, in Isaiah 9, 6, it translates to wonderful. In Isaiah 29 and 14, it translates to a wonder. And this highlights the fact that not only is God all sufficient, but he's all inspiring. He's, I mean, he is all powerful. He's sufficient. He's enough. He's almighty. And we can trust him. The next name of God is Jehovah Shalom. Now that one ought to be easy for a lot of you to, to know what it means. It, it means the Lord our peace. Um, you hear a lot of people say Shalom. Um, that means peace. The Lord our peace. Um, and we really don't have to deep dive that one because, you know, when when you've got God, when you've believed on him, when you've trusted him, and you've trusted his son, you have peace. Um, it, it just come, It's a total package here. And God is the bringer of that peace in our lives. Jehovah Shalom, we see the first time in Judges. I believe it's in Judges. It says, we in, um, in Judges 6, 24, then Gideon built an altar there unto the Lord and called it Jehovah Shalom. Unto this day it is it is yet in in Ophrah the of the Abizrites. Here we have Gideon acknowledging God's peace and he's being reassured by God. All right, so Jehovah Shalom, very easy one, <clears throat> means the Lord our peace. The next one we're going to look at, the, the tenth one, is uh, Jehovah Sabe, uh, excuse me, Jehovah Sabat. Excuse me, I almost said it wrong. Now, this one gets confused by a lot of people. Um, a lot of people like to the they like to say that the Sabat here is talking about the Sabbath. So that has nothing to do with that. So just 
this highlights that God has command over heavenly armies. Um, it, the Jehovah Sabbat, it means the Lord of hosts. Now you'll see that that means he's the Lord of armies. Um, this emphasizes the fact that God has leadership over armies of heaven. Uh, we see this in um, 1 Samuel, uh, 1 Samuel 1, 3. It says, and, and this man went up out of the city yearly to worship and to sacrifice unto the Lord of hosts in Shiloh. <clears throat> this is um, uh, this is uh, El Elkanah. He's he's uh, worshiping God. He's recognizing his supreme authority. Um, he's the by supreme authority. He's even in control over these angel armies. Now we we sing songs about it. Um, we we can understand here that this is where we get the names that we sing about. Um, and for those of you that sing. It might be a good idea to know some of these names. It'll help you uh, help you write in a song. All right, the next one is going to is number eleven. It's hard to spell. It's harder to say. Um, <clears throat> it is Jehovah Sidkenu. Jehovah Sidkenu, and that's you know, Jehovah, the normal spelling, and then T S I D K E N U, and this means the Lord our righteousness. And you know what? Ironically, this one's hard to say. This is the hardest thing for people to admit. People want to be self-righteous, but the Lord is our righteousness. Nothing you've done, nothing I've done, everything that his son has done. The Lord our righteousness. This emphasizes God's ability to make us righteous through his son, through him. First time we see it is in Jeremiah 23 and 6. It says, this is the name whereby we shall be called, why he shall be called the Lord our righteousness. Now, if, if you have a King James Bible, it's going to say the Lord our righteousness, all caps, the entire thing, the Lord our righteousness. Now, here we have Jeremiah, he's... he's um, prophesying about a coming Messiah, and he's he's recognizing God's righteousness um, by sending that Messiah. Um, I'm going to say the word again. I'll spell it for you one more time. Um, it is Jehovah Sidkenu, and that's T-S-I-D-K-E-N-U. And this, ref this is God's righteousness and this is this gives us an opportunity to to understand that our righteousness comes from Him. Um, I like to think about. Um, I, I like to give a little reference every now and then. I, I watched uh, the Marvel comics movies, and there's there's one time where, um, and the Avengers, the first Avengers movie, where Captain America and Iron Man are going back and forth with each other, and Iron Man says to Captain America, "Everything good about you came out of a bottle." Well, you know, everything good about me came from the Lord. Um, I've got I've got no um, claim whatsoever to any righteousness. Without His righteousness, there is none. There's none worth There's none worth having. And it goes for anyone who's ever going to be found righteous. It's going to be through the Lord, or you're not going to be found righteous. The next name we have is Jehovah Shema, and this name it highlights God's presence. Uh, Jehovah Shema. It translates uh, two different ways here. It translates the to the one close by, or the one present. Now, this emphasizes the fact that God is going to be present with His people. We can uh, see it in Ezekiel and chapter forty-eight, verse thirty-five. It says, "And the name of the city from that day shall be the Lord is there." Now, this is um, Jehovah Shema. And now, one thing we can know is the Lord's always near. I want you to um, I want you to think about the uh, the book of Daniel when they were in the in the the uh, the fiery furnace. You know, the Lord was with them there. He's the, He's Jehovah Shema. All right. Uh, then we have similar to El Elyon, 
we have Jehovah Elyon, and this is the Lord our Blesser. Um, that's Jehovah El Elyon, E L Y O N, and we get to see it first in the book of Psalms. Now, we understand that God is the one, He's the provider, He He's our righteousness, He's our blesser. Um, we get to see it first in Psalm 7 and 17. It says, I will praise the Lord according to his righteousness, and I will sing praise to the name of the Lord Most High. Now, here the the psalmist is praising God for his righteousness and praising God for his, for his blessings. Y'all don't forget to do that. You know, people... People pray and they they have their hand out to God, seeking seeking God's hand. Seek His face, give Him praise, give Him honor, give Him glory, because you're already blessed. He's already provided. Don't forget that. Now, this name Jehovah Elion, it does reflect that God's role is as our blesser. Like He doesn't want to keep anything from you, um, but He does. He, he does want you to be appreciative. Starting with uh, appreciating what his son's done by trusting and believing on it, not thinking that you've got to add anything to it, but trusting that what he's done is enough. The next one, and we've got two left here, um, counting this one, is Jehovah Ra. That's R A A H. And this is the name that highlights God's role as our shepherd. You can think of it like sheep, like bots, ra, ra. No, that's stupid. But anyway, you got it. Maybe that'll be in your brain somewhere. Jehovah Ra, the Lord our shepherd. This name emphasizes the fact that God is our is our God. He is our He is our our light. He is our um. He He leads us. We see it in Psalms. Um, appropriate, right? Because you, David was a shepherd boy. Uh, but we encounter the name of Psalms 23. Very, uh, very famous psalm here. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Here we have David acknowledging a lot of things. God's protection, God's leadership, God's um, provision. A lot of things get acknowledged with Jehovah Ra. And, you know, you think about that relationship that a sheep has with the shepherd. Sheep trust the shepherd. And so trust is another big issue. Now, the number 15 here is Jehovah. Now, we see that word uh, used with other words to help describe and to help describe God. But the word Jehovah means the one who is. Now, this is not to be confused with the name Yahweh, um, this is the same word that they they get the word Yahweh from, but that Yahweh is a false pagan moon god, um, and it's it's so it's so ridiculous. They the Jews have had so many gods; it's it's unreal. Um, they they've been caught worshiping this one, been caught worshiping that one. Mo, I mean, Moses called them making idols for crying out loud. And when they when they really they just started really worshiping um, God um, through the different laws and things of that nature. They, and here they go. They have all these idols, all these false gods that are out there. Yahweh is just another one. That's all it is. That's all it ever was. They try to sell you a bill of goods to make you make you believe that um, that Jehovah is Yahweh. No, it is not. Um, that goes for Allah as well. There's neither one of those are Jehovah God. Neither one of those are the the one who is. Those are false gods. the The word Jehovah literally translates to the one who is or the one who exists. That desert pagan moon god doesn't exist. This emphasizes God's eternal and self-existing nature. And think about this. A moon god? Our god created the moon. Why in the world, why in the world would we want to, to demote him to be God of, 
God of something that he created there. He's God over everything. We see the name Jehovah in Scripture more than 5,500 times. I think it's 5,516. I think that's... Um, but they start all the way from Genesis 4.26. Um, it says, Then began men to call upon the name of the Lord, all caps. Um, and when you see the Lord, all caps, it's coming from Jehovah. And now in the New Testament, it's translated Lord, capital L, lowercase o-r-d. Um, that's, um, that's not an error in the New Testament by any stretch of the means. So there was a, a precedent set forward by the, uh, by the Septuagint, the uh, a lexicon, it, uh, and the, the word Jehovah, it's, uh, it's never used as, as the Jehovah, uh, but it's always used as the one true God. I would, now, there's some, there's some different examples of that thing. Um, for example, uh, we have uh, the phrase God of Israel, but we never see the Jehovah of Israel. Uh, and in fact, the word Jehovah specifically um, we see in Scripture untranslated. Uh, we see it four times, and we know it translates to Lord, but they have it there very specifically. But we see the living God, but we never see the living Jehovah. Um, in 1 Samuel 1.3, um, is a is a really good example. We have the angel of the Lord, and that that is from Jehovah, all caps. Um, in Zechariah three two, you have another example where it says the Lord rebuke thee. Um, but this is all comes from that name, Jehovah. So the name Jehovah, it represents and reflects God's eternal existence and a supreme authority. And that is why they want to attack that name. And they try to say, oh, you don't know how to pronounce it. It's, it's Yahweh. No. They're trying to rob God of glory. And we'll sit back and, and, and we'll let them because we'll, we'll be good, quiet little Christians, right? Just like they want us to be. Uh, you need to get in here and you need to understand what these names mean. You need to have that closer relationship with God. Now, you guys have listened to this lesson. You, you've got, a, you got a, a taste for this thing. I hope that you get a uh, that taste leads to a hunger and you you deep dive these things uh, for yourself. This entire lesson is available now in audio and also in script. Go study these things out. Uh, they're they're right there on the website. You click the link on my profile. You can you can access this thing. It's it's waiting on you. Do a study. This would be a great study for um, for anybody to do. At home, you can watch the video. You don't even have to take the test if you don't want to, but watch the video. And I would encourage you, yes, do take the test, especially when it's free and it could lead to getting a uh, certificate of theology. Um, but anyway, guys, I hope you're. Um, oh, I got this little thing on the screen. It's telling me I need to. I need to verify that I'm still here for some reason. Like they can't tell that I'm still here. All right. Well, guys, guys and gals, guys and guys, thank y'all for uh, watching. We'll get this. Uh, I'm gonna pray us out, and I'm gonna end this live. Then I'll start right back, just to make sure that it doesn't get uh, get deleted or anything. All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, Lord, we come to you, Lord, today in the name of Jesus, Lord, in the name of all names, God. Lord, we thank you today, Lord, for the hearing and the and the preaching of your word, Lord. Lord, we thank you for the for the wonderful names that you have out there, God. We thank you, Lord, for for everything that those names means and everything those names represent to us, Lord. Lord, I pray that this could be used to not only help somebody with the, going through their um, through the quiz, Lord, but to help somebody grow in a, in a closer walk with you, Lord. Lord, we'll give you all the praise, all the honor, and all the glory. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Y'all be good, be blessed. I'm going to end this one. I'll be right back.